So thank you for joining us all at the Tuesday uh, LASIS lunchtime lecture. My name is Dr. Sarah McKinnon, and I'm actually the faculty director of LASIS. Um, okay. <laughs> You're like, thank you for that. <laughs> And I'm really excited to be uh, presenting actually um, a new research project, a new project that I've been working on. My collaborator, Erin Barbado, um, who works with me on this project, could not be here with us today because she had a family emergency. So I'll do my best to represent the work for both of us. Um, there may be some slides that I skip over or move through quickly because she knows more about those elements than I do, but I'll try, I'll do my best. Um, and then I also wanted to mention that this is, is a larger project that also includes a health component and we're working with Professor Jorge Osorio on that component. Um, we won't be presenting too much on the health component this time, but hopefully in the future, we'll have some, um, some data and some analysis to offer um, as we move. So my plan for this presentation today is this. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about global migration as a broad idea. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I want to give us a, a little bit of context about that. Then we're going to move to two uh, migration contexts where the Migration in the Americas project has been most active in the last well, the year, last year, it's been, really been running since the last year. Um, so I'll, I'll talk both about Colombia and the Darien Gap region, and then I'll talk about the Mexican migration that we've been working in. And then I'm going to move to talk about our work, so what we have been doing. And I'll say at the outset that this is very much more of a participatory and community-based um, project where we're implementing actions and activities, working with various organizations um, to implement those activities. And then the research, the writing, the publications will, will come after. So what I'm going to focus on today is the action and the activity um, that we've been implementing to really think about a transnational um, immigrant, uh, Im immigrant justice or immigration uh, legal clinic. And so I'll talk a little bit about what that has meant for us today. So in terms of thinking about global migration, one of the things that I always like to start with is the idea that migration comes in many forms. So when we talk about the term migrant or migration, we really mean many things. Uh, we mean everything from family-based forms of migration and employment-based forms of migration to those who move across nation state borders to study um, and forced displacement. And I think it's also important to recognize that quite often in, uh, in political discourse or in the rhetoric about migration, these constructs and categories seem very defined and um, like they're very separate when in fact the experience of migration means that there are very much blurry lines between each of these categories. And so in our project, we don't really do a lot of work to to distinguish be between them because we think the blurriness is actually really important. Um, and so I just wanna put that out as some, some definitional um, elements to what um, frame our work. It's also important to recognize that when we're talking about migration globally, we're talking about uh, a pretty significant number of the world's population that is on the move. Uh, the UNHCR and UN report uh, upwards of 280 million um, people on the move today, and about 100 million of those in uh, situations of forced displacement, which means they had to move because there was no other option. And there's a, a lot that we can do to talk about that notion of forced. Um, it's beyond the scope of what I'll have time to talk about today, but I think it's helpful to recognize that. Something that's also helpful is to recognize how these migration numbers track with the world's population. I think there's a lot of discourse right now about mig migrants and migration taking over. When you look at the, the, the way migration and people on the move track with the world's population, um, people on the move have stayed around four and 5% of the world's population through many decades. And so, that here's one disconnect between the myth of migration that we hear in political discourse, the way migration is politicized, and the realities of migration, that this, this movement tracks with um, the way um, the world's population has grown. 
what we can say has changed, especially in the last, uh, what is that number? Uh, I would say five years or so, is that the number of forcibly displaced people in the last five years, the last 10 years, has risen cr quite dramatically. So the figure of 100 and, about 100 uh, million or 110 million of the world's population is are in forcibly displaced conditions. Um, really, we can we can see this um, to be the case dramatically so in the last um, few years. And so uh, I'll I'll talk a, a little bit about that by way of the uh, individuals that we're working to serve. I'm going to narrow in now on the Americas. So really, this project is about the Western Hemisphere. And when we look at the projections for this year about uh, forcibly displaced persons in the Western Hemisphere, um, we're talking about, about 25 million um, people who are in forcibly displaced conditions in um, the Americas. That con that that um, includes all of those categories of migration that uh, I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. Okay, so this is a, a little bit of context of global migration, just to give us a sense of the scope of people on the move today. I'm gonna move now to talk about uh, the two research contexts, the two contexts that we're working in today. And the first context is a context of Colombia and the Darien Gap. You can see here, I just uh, gave a talk for East High School. Um, and so it was really interesting to see the students' eyes pop when they when they imagine Madison to um, Nicocli and just how far away that is. Um, I, I'm gonna keep on narrowing in to this research context where we're working at. So Nicocli, Colombia is right on the Bay of Uruba. And um, so you can see on this uh, map that there's a bay and across the bay is Akandi and Caporgana. So myself and Aaron and our research team have been working with humanitarian groups in Nekokli, um, both there and afar, to um, work on implementing and expanding the legal assistance, access to legal information that folks have. I want to give you some context for Nekokli and the Darien Gap region a little bit. So these are some images that I took in Akandi, or I'm sorry, in Nekokli when I was there, I believe this was last year. Um, you can see that this is a, a, a small fishing village in many ways. Um, Nekokli is a, is a small village of about 40,000 people. Um, historically, the local economy was built around local tourism, so tourism within the region of Antioquia um, and, the, and fishing. Um, and then Across the bay from that is what is known as the Darien Gap region. So there's you know, been a, a lot of information in the news, especially the last few years, about what the movement through the Darien Gap means for people. Um, we really began to see these images, images of people moving through jungle-like space, well, jungle spaces, um, muddy, there's no infrastructure. Uh, you can imagine uh, in a jungle what people are exposed to. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But really, in terms of the, the political circulation of a message, attention to the Darien Gap region began around 2001 to 2021 um, and has continued um, since then. People who are moving through this area, the, the numbers have risen really dramatically a year after year after year. So prior to 2021, this was not a common route for uh, human migration um, in the Americas. Uh, it was, uh, known for various things, but it was not known as a route for human migration. That changed really dr drastically in 2021 for a number of reasons that are um, beyond the scope of my talk today, but I'm happy to talk about in our Q&A. Uh, in 2021, the numbers rose to about 130,000 through, through uh, the Darien Gap. And these are figures that come from the Panamanian government. So uh, they're tracking on the other side um, movement through this area. In 2022, it was closer to 250,000, and this past year, um, 520,000 individuals uh, moved through the Darien Gap. 
2023, the top nationalities were probably unsurprisingly folks from Venezuela, uh, folks from Ecuador and um, Colombia. Those are those two are are in some ways confusing because it might also be that one had a nationality and then they had a kid in a, in a, 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 maybe Ecuador or Colombia who has permanent residency. And so it's those numbers are a little fuzzy, um, but certainly those nationalities um, are significant. Also folks from Haiti, um, China is a really significant um, migration route. We've The last week I've seen lots of stories about Chinese migration um, through the Darien Gap, which I think is helpful in drawing attention to that. And then other, right? The, the um, 43,000 other is a really interesting um, uh, figure as well. So this is uh, an image that is in the um, PAO, the Punto de, Aten de Atención de Organizaciones. Um, it's this little uh, house in Necocli where all of the humanitarian organizations, there are about like 20 plus that work there, um, come together and they, they have meetings and training sessions and they just, it's a, a place to meet and to, to get a sense of what's happening. So here they track where their clients, where the people they work with come from. And you can see on this, like this handmade map that really migration through uh, the Darien Gap is quite global. Uh, there is a significant population of movement from um, African countries to Brazil and then northward. Um, there's a significant um, a movement of folks from places like Afghanistan or Turkmenistan, uh, Kazakhstan, um, to places like Venezuela and then moving northward. So that I think is really significant to just understand about this movement. And the, the movement of nationalities is also in flux. So whereas in 2023, the primary nationality were Venezuelans, if you go back to 2015, it was primarily people from Haiti and Cuba. Um, uh, so Haiti and Cuba in this figure is the blue. Uh, Asia, uh, you know, the continent of Asia is the, is the orange. Um, Africa is the lime green. Um, and purple is Venezuela. So you can kind of see that it moves. So as geopolitical dynamics shift, um, as foreign policy collaborations happen to make restrictions more significant also changes the 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 flow of individuals through um, through this region. One of the things that the humanitarian groups that we work with noted significantly about 2023 was the dramatic age shift in who they were seeing moving. So in 2023 about 80% um, of people moving through Necocli and the Darien Gap were over the age of 18, um, but that meant that 20% were under the age of 18, and half of those individuals were under the age of five. Um, so kind of just like wrap your brain around under the age of five, um, moving through, through jungle-like conditions. This is an image of, uh, so there's a Tienda Humanitaria in Necocli that's run by UNICEF. And this is a place where individuals can go and just get the basic things that they're going to need to hopefully safely, as safe as can be, uh, move for a week, maybe three days. Numbers change, but move for a number of days on foot through, jung the, through the jungle. Um, and here, the, the workers at, the UNICEF workers at the uh, Tienda were explaining to this mom uh, and um, who's just about to get on a boat how to keep her baby safe as uh, as they're making the move. Um, so you can see here she was explaining how to wrap, how to use one of their wraps. What are those called? I never just wraps. Okay, there's not a more technical word. I love it. Okay, so the, the long wraps that really keeps a baby like close to one's chest to keep them safe um, as they're moving through slippery, hard to navigate terrain um, through, the, through the jungle. And what really struck me as I um, overheard these two workers from UNICEF really like 
calmly and compassionately explain how to use this is that along the way, they were also providing other pre prevention and um, safety messages and just, you know, trying to share as much information as possible um, to keep the mom and the, the baby um, as safe as can be. All right, so this, that, all of that is mostly, as I was talking about in Necocli, you can see here are some of the common pathways the common pathways, there are multiple pathways through the Darien Gap. So there are a number of walking pathways. Um, some take uh, many days, up to a week. Some are one or two days now. Every, actually, every time I'm in Nickel the, the the amount of time, they get shorter. So the pathways um, are increasingly shorter. But to use those pathways, you also have to pay more. So that is something that is, I think, really important to pay attention to. There's also water pathways. So um, a lot of the communities that can pay the most um, are actually using water pathways. Um, that doesn't, though, necessarily mean that they're any safer. There are lots of reports of drownings um, on the boats. Um, and recently I've learned about, uh, in conversation with folks that we're working with about a new migration pathway in Colombia to the San Andres Islands. And the, the drownings in that context are really significant. More attention is needed um, to that context as well. So I'm just gonna talk some briefly about what, what we see as we're in this context. So something that's really important is that it's a changing geopolitical and legal context. I feel like it's almost weekly or monthly that uh, policies change. These might be policies in the United States, they might be policies in Colombia, po policies in Panama, and that changes the, the movement, the way people can move, how they can move, if they're considering moving. So that constantly ch changing context also then changes uh, migration patterns. There's also a really, intricate involvement of criminal organizations. I am not an expert in this um, aspect of it, but uh, it is it, it pervades what's happening in a, a context like um, Necocli, Akandi, certainly in Panama as well. Um, and so in the Q&A, we can also talk about ways that criminal organizations may be involved. There's also a lot of misinformation about uh, options available. So there's a lot of discussion about, you know, if you get to the United States, this, you'll have this available, this available, this available, and that may not always be realistic. Um, same about migration routes. Uh, technology has really infused the um, human migration in a way that a decade ago was not the case. And so for, you know, for example, right now you could get on TikTok and find um, a lot of information about how to cross the Darien Gap, right? Like that is just incredible. And it, and people use those, those methods to learn about what's happening. Um, WhatsApp groups are significant. There are um, giant WhatsApp groups that are passing information along, sharing information. And so that also becomes a, a, a method of sometimes providing really trusted information. The groups that we work with in Necocli, most of them have WhatsApp um, channels that connect people to actual humans. It's not an automated response. Um, there's a there's a campaign that the GIFME has, GIFME Contigo, that does exactly that and helps people have access to information along uh, along the route. So from Colombia through to Mexico, they can have access to that. Um, so that's another element that's important. Human right, uh, rights violations along the journey are also really significant. Um, certainly there's societal stigma and discrimination um, that individuals face along the way. Um, some of this is on the basis of all sorts of difference, right? So, so race really matters. Uh, language access really matters. Um, there's a sense of the changing, um, the changing reception to to, to mi migration. So, you know, at the beginning in Nicolcli, there was a sense of, oh, pe people moving through this this town. This is great because it's 
a boom for the economy, but that changes um, over time. And so dynamics of integration, dynamics of reception are also uh, important to pay attention to. And in the context of Nikokli, I think it's also really important to recognize the layers of violence. So um, the, the, the community is our survivors of armed conflict. Um, and there, so there's that layer. And then there's also people that, who decide to stay because of migration, who have moved there. And then there are um, people on the move through this area. So you have a lot of really complex dynamics that come into play and really shape what um, societal reception uh, means in a context like that. Physical violence is huge along the pathway. A, a, a lot of this is um, connected to just not having safe places to sleep, not having safe places. I mean, not it's not a safe movement, but not having safe places to sleep also really matter. Um, craft, uh, crime, theft, and exploitation. The dynamics of exploitation are so intricate. And I think in the United States, we've learned a lot about this in the context of Mexico. That is quite applicable in the pathward um, uh, further south as well. Also, the rates of sexual violence are uh, astounding. Um, and then human trafficking is also really significant. This is a slide for Jorge in the presentation. So the groups that we work with in Necocli are also doing a lot of really great work um, to address people's health needs, but there are also continue to be uh, needs. Um, so in this context, and then continuing along the pathway, there are waterborne and vector-borne um, illnesses um, that uh, are significant that really impact um, someone's health um, and then also needs to attend to those. So that's a, a really big need there. The nutrition needs of children and pregnant um, pregnant women is also really significant. Um, that every time I'm in Necocli, people talk about, how, you know, how do we, well, first, like the idea of moving while pregnant is really significant, um, but, but then how do we keep, um, the the nutrition needs um, it, it present for um, pregnant moms. Malnutrition, dehydration are also really significant. And then a, a range of uh, musculoskeletal um, issues like fractures, bites, um, breaks. You can imagine moving on foot for so long um, in those conditions. Like it's just it's bound to, you know, you're bound to have something um, uh, be hurt. And then men mental wellness challenges. These, these are contexts of significant trauma, and it's not a trauma that you, um, you it, it doesn't end, right? It keeps on going, it keeps on going, it keeps on going. Um, in Necocli, the health work is pretty interesting. So there are mobile clinics that are present. The Red Cross and the IOM have mobile health clinics. The health clinics have like basic physical assistance, so physical needs, but also dentistry. So that is a, a pretty significant. And then mental wellness is also always attended to as well. So all three of those elements are attended to. All right, I'm going to skip to um, the Mexican context. Uh, so, you know, this movement continues northward. Um, each country has its own unique context. So it's also important to think about what movement means through Central America. Um, there are some countries that, you know, here's your permit to stay and we're gonna put you on a bus and you keep going, right? Obviously with a fee, there's always a fee attached to everything. Um, so we've been also working most recently in Mexico to try to address the legal needs I want to talk a little bit about what the context means there. Um, this image has a few of the really common migration pathways um, as people enter Mexico. Um, and as of 2020, uh, there are over 250 shelters um, along that pathway. So the shelter infrastructure is a really important um, infrastructure to, to think about in terms of providing um, for, for the needs of people in on the move, pe people in movement. Um, this image is a little bit hard to see, but some of the significant ones you can pay, see on the map are um, along the border. So Tijuana and Ciudad Juarez are really significant um, places. Lesser known 
places in Mexico are also really significant, like Saltillo uh, is an important um, migration um, pathway, and there's a, uh, there's a shelter there. Um, Guadalajara, Ciudad de Mexico, um, all of these elements. And then also in Chiapas, so Tapachula is a really significant um, point in the migration route. Um, I won't have time to talk about it today, but the but but the the infrastructure between the shelters and then for many who decide to stay in Mexico, applying for refugee status in Mexico, um, those two things kind of go together. So I can spend a little bit of time uh, on that in the Q and A if you have questions. Oh yeah. So I'm going to move now to the northern border, which is where we've been doing most of our work as a, a as a collective. Um, and talk about the context for asylum seekers at the U.S.-Mexico border. Some of this will probably be familiar to, um, to us because uh, we hear a lot about it in the news. Just as a quick overview, so many of the individuals that arrive at the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, their goal is to seek asylum. And this is because that's kind of the only option you have at this point, right? Uh, an asylum is one of the um, remaining and we'll see, <laughs> one never knows what's going to happen with political changes, but it's one of the remaining humanitarian protections that are in place. To uh, qualify as an asylum seeker, someone has to be at or within the border of the, Uni uh, the United States. So you can't apply for asylum in Colombia, right? You apply when you're at or within the border of the United States. And it has to be on the basis of a fear of past or future persecuting, persecution relating to one of these five categories. Um, a lot of the work of Erin, my collaborator and the Immigrant Justice Clinic at UW-Madison that she directs is in helping, um, is in helping individuals with their asylum. And so that uh, is something we can talk about also in the, in the Q&A if you have questions. Let's see. There we go. There are a lot of things, a lot of political dynamics that are preventing people from having a chance to apply for asylum. So based on the United States' adoption of various international protocol, one should have the right to apply for asylum. Um, it's a part of the UN um, HD, uh, uh, Human Rights Declaration. It's a part of our refugee definition, the 1967 um, Protocol of non Um, And yet there are many policies in place right now that really make it hard even to have access to apply for asylum. We've learned a lot about walling strategies in the last few years. I, I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, we've also learned probably about de detention strategies. Um, many individuals upon coming and saying, I, I fear returning to my home country, they may be placed in detention. And that is a huge shock and also becomes a strategy um, preventing people from, from accessing that. Um, most recently, what's become really kind of a tool that's used um, is mandating that people first use the CBP-1 application. So first, once you get from Mexico City northward in Mexico, you then have access to uh, this application on a phone that's called CBP-1. And individuals who move through um, a third country must use this application. So the transit ban is what, I, what, what I'm referring to about the, the must use this. So that means that, um, I mean, there's a lot of things that that means. It means, you know, you have to have a telephone, you have to have really good Wi-Fi um, service. Um, you have to be able to read in Spanish, English, or I think it's French. Those are the three languages in which it's available in order to fill out the application. Um, and in theory, when you look at the policy, there are some exceptions. So the US outlines particular exceptions, people who shouldn't have to use the application. For example, Mexicans should not have to use the CBP-1 app. But in practice, uh, CBP and Mexican immigration officials are in, in really subtle and more direct ways in insisting that people use the app. So in shelters in Tijuana, shelters in um, Ciudad Juarez, 
uh, yes, there are many individuals from all over the world, but there are also people from Mexico, from victims of internal conflict there, of forced displacement there, who are waiting in shelters and waiting for their application. Um, all of those elements are ways that it prevents people from um, claiming asylum. So while waiting in Mexico, shelter conditions vary widely. Um, it takes months to get a CBP-1 appointment. So this is not just, you know, wait and two weeks later you have an appointment. No, it's typically for many, many months. Um, if people try to enter the U.S. without inspection, they lose their right to apply for asylum. So that immediately is something that's off the table. There are other forms of protection that are still available, but they're not avenues for permanent residency and um, citizenship. So that dynamic is really, I think, significant. And they'll likely be put in detention or deported very quickly. Um, as I mentioned, many in Mexico are, uh, many in shelters, especially in the north, so in Tijuana, are from Mexican states like Michoacan and Guerrero that are contacts of violence there. This is more the case in uh, the northern borders, in the, in the northern shelters. In the shelters like in Guadalajara or Ciudad de Mexico, uh, it's less so Mexican. So that's an interesting dynamic. It kind of depends on where you're at. Uh, the the um, demography really changes. The population really changes. Also in shelters are individuals from all over the world. Um, and they many are waiting for their CBP-1 app. And they may be waiting, especially if they're in a place like Mexico City, they may be waiting for a refugee status in Mexico. So this is also a mixed migration context. Colombia is a mixed migration context. Mexico is very much a mixed migration context. Um, and there are people who have been deported. So that's another layer, especially in Mexico, that you see people who are, who are who have been returned to the context, and so that adds another layer. Um, in these contexts, there are high rates of violence and extortion, also kidnapping and disappearances, especially in um, some of the northern states, um, are also really significant. All right, so I'm going to end in the last little time before I hand it over to Q&A um, with a, a discussion about what we're doing. So here, that's the context. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the things that we're doing to address that. Our goal with this project, especially the legal and the information element is to think about the construction of a transnational immigration clinic. One of the things that be, has become really clear to us in conversations and in interviews that we're doing is that the structure of national immigration systems uh, is not the way that people experience migration. Migration is absolutely a transnational phenomenon, which means uh, the legal infrastructure in the United States and Mexico and all of them sometimes are involved in someone's experience. And yet the way we construct information and legal practice about immigration is very much a national construct. And so that's one of the things that we're um, working to, to challenge. The first part of this is, oh, uh, actually, no, this is still summary. So, so what we, actually, let me just go back. Oh yeah, that's fine. So these are the five things that we're really working to do. And I'm gonna talk about each really quickly. Um, the first thing that we're doing is offering legal information dissemination. So, and this was particularly clear when we began speaking with folks in Colombia that there's there's really not as much information about U.S. immigration laws and programs and policies in that context as there should be. And so, the legal clinics we work with, the humanitarian groups, they're interacting and interfacing with people in transit whose goal often is to come to the United States, but there's not a lot of information about what those programs and policies look like. So we're trying to bridge that gap. One of the big things that we've been doing in the last year is offering webinars about particular programs and profiles um, of US immigration processes um, and protocol. We have one actually on Friday, um, ¿Cuál es la situación para migrantes en la frontera de Estados Unidos en México? Feel free to join, it's online, it's in Spanish and it is free. So feel free to join, I'm happy to send that information. Um, we did one uh, a few months ago about 
Um, what happens to unaccompanied minors? Um, that is a huge question, especially for individuals that work with kids um, along the route. So what happens when they get to the United States? What's the, what's the next step? And a lot of it is that. We think that if we can provide people with more information, they have a better chance to make better decisions about their options. And so that's the goal there. In addition to the webinars, we do lots of presentations and we do lots of training. So uh, about a month ago, I was with a group in Coahuila, in Saltillo, and I trained um, a group of master's students or his, like master's students in history who are then um, going to work in the shelter um, in Saltillo um, providing this information. So it's kind of like a train the trainers model of disseminating information about US immigration programs and policies. I'm going to skip over this. I had a clip ready to show you what some of our webinars look like, but uh, that's fine. I don't need to. I don't need to continue that. But anyway, this is just Aaron and I, kind of in our little shtick of how we present the information. These videos are available on our website, so you can always go back and look at them if you have questions or if if, if you know people that might want this information, feel free to pass those links on. Uh, in terms of the reach of those webinars and of our network, um, we typically have about 100 plus people in the live webinar. Um, and now about 500 plus people are on our email contact list who get the information about it. And um, about 1,000 people, um, actually 1,000 plus in our LinkedIn. Our LinkedIn website is... Uh, a place where we publish about the, the webinars, but we also repost a lot of really great policy documents about migration in the Americas. Um, we try to think of that as a hub for not only, not really our information, it's more like distributing really good, um, trusted information of others. There's some really great stuff happening. And this is a list of the organizations and the universities, as well as the countries of participants that have been um, involved in the webinars. We also do policy and field briefs, so we're really trying to shift the way we think about um, writing to uh, to reach a more public audience, an audience that that might need the information more quickly than uh, publishing in the in U.S. academia involves. And so the policy and field briefs are a really great way to do that, and we're hoping to expand um, that uh, this year. That's one of the goals. We've also uh, been working on creating stories. And so this is a podcast that we have that you can find on Spotify. It's called In Transit. Um, there's just one story up there right now. It's five minutes long. It's I think uh, our goal is that we can create um, clips that can be used in teaching practices and various practices. Um, it's based on an interview that we did with Noir, who is a Cameroonian uh, man who applied for asylum through the Immigrant Justice Clinic and won asylum in the United States. He moved through the Darien Gap in, I think he said, 2017, so a little bit earlier than um, what I discussed um, just a moment ago. Um, but in this, in the, the first episode, he's actually talking about uh, how shocking it was or just what it meant when he got to finally speak to a CBP-1 official, and then the next step was to put him in handcuffs, handcuffs and put him in a de detention center. Um, so the shock of that, right, fleeing Cameroon, coming through this really, you know, intense journey, and then that's the reception. So that story is about, uh, is about that experience. We also post stories on our, our website or at our um, Instagram. So Migration Americas is an Instagram um, that you can can follow if you like Instagram. Um, and we try to post snapshots of things that um, we see in the field or elements about migration in the Americas that we think are important. We also try to spotlight fantastic organizations that are on the ground doing important work. Um, so uh, in the, this, this image right here with the people standing in line, it's a quick story about the significance of waiting, what, what, just how much waiting um, human migration means for many people. And then this is an image of the bus that one takes from Medellin to Necocli. Uh, and it talks about how 
Um, many arrive on that bus, but some people walk from Medellin to Nicocli. And so that that's just a story about that. Little snapshots to, to nuance and complicate uh, what, what we think of when we think of migration. Uh, we also, and this is really in conjunction with Erin and her students at the Immigrant Justice Clinic, um, we provide Know Your Rights uh, presentations and individual consultations. This is something that she has been doing for many years. I think she's really um, vanguard in this way. She. Um, uh, every month, her, her she and her students are in the detention center in Dodge County, um, doing consultations with uh, with individuals detained there. Um, they also do experiential trips to places like Dilly, Texas, the detention center there, um, to Al Otro Lado in um, Tijuana, um, and in those places, it's you know providing people a sense of like what are your rights? How do you move through this process? What is asylum? Uh, how do you prepare for an asylum case? Um, and then taking time to do one-on-one -on -one, um, conversations with people that have questions. These are some images of the time that we spent in September in Tijuana. Um, you can see we, uh, two of the audiences where we gave presentations and we did consultations. And this was this is not going to be the best because this is more Aaron's expertise. But one of the other things that we're doing is doing consultation on transnational cases. So there are so I mean, every day I feel like I learn of another avenue that that makes immigration or the experience of immigration really transnational. Here are some cases that she has worked on and that we're working on currently. Um, so um, working with a gay man who was in Mexico actually fleeing persecution um, from Cuba and HIV positive. That's one of the cases you can imagine. There's three countries that are involved. Um, or currently working with a man who is deported from the United States who has eligibility for a U visa. So he was in the United States for a while, was deported by the U.S. government. Uh, he's eligible for a U visa, um, which is, you know, if you've been a victim of a, of a crime. And so he's now in Mexico and she's she and her students are working with him to hopefully help him to get that U visa so he can be repatriated back to the United States, like those dynamics. In Colombia, uh, we have been consulting with a case of uh, so there was a Venezuelan man who who uh, moved through the journey that I talked about. He arrived in the United States and he was put in detention. And so we helped him connect with his his very worried um, spouse who's in Colombia and trying to help provide them with with access to information and legal resources. Um, and then we've been working on a case of a Haitian woman who is in Colombia. Uh, while in Colombia, she had a child with a U.S. citizen, and um, and now she's in, in, still in Colombia and kind of trying to figure out where does the kid go? The the um, the dad is back in the United States, like those sorts of dynamics. So you can imagine as we layer these things together, it gets more and more complicated to think about how to provide legal uh, resources to individuals. And there are many challenges to that. Um, uh, resource challenges. There's really no government funding. There's really not even a lot of private funding for, for this sort of service. So we're trying to think about ways to um, develop um, in creative ways, um, more funding for this sort of work. Um, there's difficulty in communi communicating. You can imagine the complexities of trying to contact contact clients or people that you're working with when you're working cross country, um, when you're working in contexts that, that maybe have less access to technology, um, that gets really challenging. Um, it's also challenging for a US lawyer to practice outside of the United States. So there are some other dynamics in terms of the legal framework that put that into, uh, that challenge that. And that's where we, have begun collaborating a lot with legal clinics in Colombia and in in Mexico, connected to universities there to try to reach to bridge those gaps. Um, you can imagine just like how yeah how complicated all of that is. 
All right. So to end, uh, first of all, I want to I always like to make sure I provide access to information about the Immigrant Justice Clinic and the Community Immigration Law Clinic. That's also in UW-Madison. If you know of people here in town or in the region that need uh, information, access to immigration law assistance, these are two really great resources. Um, the Community Immigration Law Center is really close to campus. They're always looking for volunteers. So if you feel compelled to uh, assist, that's a really great place, as well as the um, UW-Madison's IJC. There's lots of really great ways to plug in. And then the last slide here is if you want to learn more about what we're doing as, as we're doing it, as it's developing, um, both the Migration in the Americas Project and the UW IJC have Instagram. Um, so feel free to, to follow us there. Our LinkedIn is a really great place to just get access to policy documents that are, you know, from, from across the, the hemisphere. And then the website is through is the, the link there. Um, this is where you can find our policy reports that we um, that we publish. They're all available there. The webinars, the videos are available there, um, as well as a few other little bits of information. So thank you all for spending time with me today. And I look forward to questions both on Zoom and in present. <laughs>